The UAP Task Force has had a, a process in place to work with other elements of the Department of Defense and other elements of the government to ensure that there's as simple a way as possible to deconflict those. All right. Uh, with that, I want to thank you all for, for taking the time out. I also want to thank uh, my colleagues on both sides of the aisle for participating in this very uh, historical and important hearing. I think it's one of the few times we can demonstrate some degree of bipartisanship around UAPs and UFOs. So I love it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thus concluded the first public congressional hearing on UAPs in over 50 years. What had once seemed inconceivable after the closure of Project Blue Book in 1969 had finally come to pass thanks to tireless reporting of Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal exposing a dark money UAP research program hidden within the Pentagon's budget called ATIM. While the public hearing was over, the conversation continued behind closed doors, outside of view of the American people, barring them from more answers. While the government appeared to take further steps towards disclosure, a high-ranking security officer stepped out from his office and onto the national stage to expose the truth behind this strange phenomenon. Following the hearing, the Department of Defense announced the establishment of the All-Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, also known as ARO, on July 15, 2022. News Nation national correspondent Brian Enton explained the new office's purpose. Which is supposed to sort of be accountability and a way to keep track of what is actually happening in the U.S. government when it comes to UFOs. As all eyes were on the government's incremental steps, journalists Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal continued working behind the scenes, speaking to people inside the government with knowledge of UAP programs. In 2023, they uncovered their next story. Leslie made contact with a high-level intelligence guy who claimed that the government has been holding recovered craft. He did not himself witness these crash retrievals. He didn't put his hands on any supposedly recovered craft, but he gave a good enough account to be really interesting. He was represented by a former inspector general of the intelligence community, Chuck McCullough, a very high level guy who is now in private practice. So that also lend credibility because presumably a lawyer who was a very top intelligence official would not lend himself to a fabrication. They took the story to the New York Times. To their shock, the Times wasn't interested. While this person was who they said they were, the Times didn't feel the story was airtight. The main reason being that the officer's most explosive claims were all secondhand knowledge. Well, that's always a problem in this field that ideally, as a reporter, you want to be shown the craft. <laughs> you want to put your hands on it. Uh, you want to send it out for testing. But uh, it doesn't work that way in this field. And you just have to say that. No, we don't have the craft. We don't have the pieces to be analyzed. But the next best thing is who's making these claims? Are these people credible? Is there any secret agenda that they have? Undeterred, they pressed on. During their search, they landed on a new partner investigative reporter Ross Colthart. Over his decades of work, Ross had reported for the Sydney Morning Herald, ABC TV Four Corners, and 60 Minutes. Ross began working with the recently launched cable network, News Nation, to bring the story to television screens. So they started working together on vetting, figuring out exactly who he was, how would this interview actually work. It all sounded pretty wild to us. We just decided to take our time with it. Leslie Kane, and I respect her work too because she's another person that comes at it like sort of with traditional journalistic standards and vets everything that she does. And we were able to work together and she had a lot of sources and we had a lot of sources in DC. So we were able to sort of work together vetting him and also able to lean on her. We just went at it like any other story, like when you get a big scoop or a big interview, you have to do those things. And you also just have to sort of ask yourself, like, why would the person be lying? Can we really trust this person? Are they credible? So we took a lot of time going through that process and then went with it. 
The closer they got to publication, the more obstacles stood in their way. We talked to the Washington Post and they were interested in the story and they were going through all the steps that they would take to before they'd run the story. And then a bunch of things started happening that changed our timetable. His name leaked out. We were very careful to keep him confidential until we were ready to break the story. He was always going to go on the record, but it had to be in the context of, of the story once it was fully laid out. But his name leaked out on the web. He was getting threats. He was getting very uncomfortable. So we broke that story in the debrief, which is a very highly regarded website. Leslie and I had written for them uh, before. They had their own vetting. They had a lot of experts, former intelligence people and defense people. On June 5th, 2023, the front page of the debrief printed in large, bold letters. Intelligence officials say U.S. retrieved crash of non-human origin. The whistleblower was a decorated former combat officer in Afghanistan who was a veteran of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency and the National Reconnaissance Office. When the News Nation exclusive interview with the whistleblower aired on June 11th, 2023, the world got to hear, in his own words, the potentially world-altering claims. Tonight, for the first time, a former senior military intelligence officer comes forward to say what we've only imagined is true. Claims that our government has proof of alien life. We have spacecraft from another species. We do, yeah. How many? Quite a number. Some are landed, some are crashed. Allegations of a secret government program that has hidden the truth, the technology, from the world. There's a sophisticated uh, disinformation campaign targeting the U.S. populace, which is extremely unethical and immoral. And it's totally, totally frightening. The interview wasn't live with him. Ross did the interview. We had vetted him a lot before Ross did the interview. And then we sat on the interview for a little bit, just like triple checking that he was who he said he was because obviously what he was saying was so, it was such a big deal. It was it was so hard to stomach. It was so honestly like crazy at first when you heard it that we just didn't want to go with it until we knew for sure that this guy is who he said he was. And who did he say he was? My name is uh, David Grush. You know, I came from a blue collar family in Pittsburgh. I didn't have the money for college. Always admired people in uniform. And I've always wanted to be a part of something bigger than myself. You know, 18 years ago, you know, I got an Air Force scholarship for physics. I was an intel officer for the U.S. for 14 years. My last position, I co-led the UAP portfolio for the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. And some of the highest officials within the Department of Defense and Intelligence community used to call on me to advise them on some of the hardest uh, target sets that the country had. You are one of the most trusted former intelligence officials in the U.S. defense and intelligence establishment. Yes, I was. You were trusted with the most intimate secrets. Yes. I started out as a non-believer. I came to the, the problem as a hardcore physics guy, intel officer. So I have a, you know, excuse my language, high factor. I was very methodical interviewing people who didn't know each other, making sure this wasn't some kind of cover-up of some other program. They shut the door in my face. They denied me access to these programs. Once we found out that everything about him checked out, there was no real reason not to believe him. Even though what he was claiming seemed unbelievable, even to himself. The UAP task force was refused access to um, a broad crash retrieval program. Uh, these are retrieving non-human origin uh, technical vehicles, you know, call it spacecraft if you will, non-human, exotic origin vehicles that have either landed or crashed. I thought it was totally nuts and I thought at first I was being deceived, it was a ruse. People started confiding in me, they approached me. I have plenty of current and former senior intelligence officers that came to me that confided in me they were a part of a program. They named the program. They told me based on their oral testimony um, and they provided me documents and other, other proof that there was in fact a program that the UAP task force was uh, not read into. You are saying to the human race for the first time an official intelligence representative at a high level from the US government is saying publicly, we are not alone. 
we're definitely not alone. Absolutely, the data points empirically that we're not alone, yeah. You've said that we have, the United States has spacecraft, intact craft. We do. Do we have bodies? Do we have species of... What? Well, no naturally, um, when you recover something that's either landed or crashed, um, sometimes you encounter um, dead pilots. And uh, believe it or not, as, fan as fantastical as that sounds, it's true. Have you seen spacecraft? I've seen some interesting photos and I've read some very interesting reports. Some are landed, some are crashed, and I think that's an interesting discussion that's come up. You know, as advanced as, you know, we are, you know, as humans, right? You know, planes crash, cars crash. Just because you're some uh, advanced sentience that has advanced technology doesn't mean um, some small percentage of your, I'll use the Air Force term, like sorties, meet uh, an unfortunate operational conclusion, as, as we might want to say. A lot of them were very large, yeah like a football field kind of size. This is not explainable by, you know, swamp gas, uh, St. Elmo's fire, ball lightning, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, this is like tangible technical craft they're seeing um, up close and personal in some cases when I interview people. He claims that the first government to come into possession of a craft was Mussolini's regime. Italian government moved it to a secure uh, air base in Italy for the, the rest of kind of the fascist regime until 1944, 1945. And, you know, the uh, Pope Pius XII back-channeled that. So the Vatican um, was involved. Yeah, and told the Americans what the Italians had, and, and we ended up scooping it. So let me be very clear about this. You're saying that the Catholic Church, the Vatican, mm -hmm. they know about the existence of non-human intelligence on this planet. Certainly. Cautioning about jumping to conclusions. Grush refused to say that these recoveries were extraterrestrials. I would couch it as non-human intelligence, you know, NHI, like we like to say in our, our language. I don't think we have all the data to say, oh, they're coming from a certain, a certain location. And, I, and I, I couch it as somebody who studied physics where maybe they're coming from a different physical dimension as described in quantum mechanics. We know there's extra dimensions due to high energy particle collisions, etc. And there's a theoretical framework to explain that. There most likely are physical, additional spatial dimensions. And you could imagine uh, in 4 and 5D space where what we experience as linear time ends up being a physical dimension for, in higher dimensional space where if you were living there, you could translate across what we perceive as a linear flow. So there is a uh, possibility that, and it, this is a theory here, I'm not saying this is 100% the case, but uh, it could be that this is not necessarily extraterrestrial and it's actually coming from a higher dimensional physical space that might be co-located right here. Not only were the ships and bodies non-human, they may not even be peaceful, with multiple reports of harm being done to servicemen who researched and engaged with UAPs. You know, a lot of them, you know, were um, injured looking at some of this stuff. You can imagine the nuclear, radiological, and biological risk um, to looking at an unknown unknown. And a lot of them have literally suffered physically because of their service. And I think that is a, a, the logical fallacy there is because they're advanced, they're kind. We'll never really understand um, full intent in that because we're, we're not them, whatever them is. I think at least if we look at it through a humanistic lens, um, it does appear negative, at least uh, to us. I've been told that there have been attempts to bring down craft, that we've acted offensively against non-human craft. There have been instances and there are uh, certain techniques. Have human beings been hurt or killed by a non-human intelligence? Well, I can't get into the specifics because that would reveal uh, certain U.S. classified in, uh, operations. Uh, I was briefed by a few individuals on the program that there were um, malevolent events like that. Now I'm scared. People have just heard you say non-humans may well have murdered human beings. That seems to be the case at one point, yeah. Grush claims it's not only the UAPs and non-human intelligence destroying lives, but the U.S. government as well. 
there's a sophisticated uh, disinformation campaign targeting the U.S. populace, which is extremely unethical and immoral. Well, I've certainly been the recipient of a lot of U.S. government secrets, and I can tell you they've never seen the light of day. Um, that's for sure. And uh, I guess ostensibly this has leaked like a sieve for decades, but it was a very sophisticated disinformation that campaign where you know they have allowed some of the truth to come out um, through some of their their trade crafts. Uh, but they've disenfranchised people, they've stigmatized it, they made it like a this total like wacky thing to talk about. So anybody who may come forward with that kind of information is looked like a you know total tinfoil hat guy because it's a perfect amalgamation of disinformation to um, just make it look crazy. If this is true, if the stakes are so high, if the fate of the human race is at stake, Perhaps it's no surprise to hear Grush say the US government will do anything to keep these secrets safe. Can I put it to you that crimes must have been committed? At the very least, I saw substantiative evidence that white collar crime was committed. Have people been killed to protect this secret? Uh, based on the people I talked to, uh, that was an ongoing uh, concern. Yeah, unfortunately, I've heard some really un-American things I don't want to repeat right now. So you have a strong suspicion that people have been murdered to protect the Over secret. the years, yeah. Burdened with this knowledge, Grush didn't feel comfortable simply going up the chain of command. So he filed the whistleblower complaint. I mean, this is where it gets really, really complicated, but there's a process you can go through through Arrow. Grush didn't feel comfortable going through them because... He didn't feel that they would take it seriously, among other reasons, so he went the whistleblower route. It's sort of a way to express a grievance within these high levels of the government and in the intel community in a protected, as, as, as protected as you can be. It's a sense of service, you know? Call me a Boy Scout or, or whatever. It just, a, when I saw the kind of wrongdoing I did, I don't want to be 60, 70 years old in the future and uh, have that, you know, coulda, shoulda, woulda kind of uh, feeling where I, I could have made a difference. I do not want to live a life in, of regret. After confidentially providing classified information to the Department of Defense Inspector General, Grush believed his identity was unveiled to individuals and or entities within DOD, which he claims caused months of retaliation and reprisals. Due to it being classified, Grush claimed he could not unveil the name of the program, but it was funded with dark money. Much like ATIP before it, Brian Enton explained. The way that it's been kind of described to me is like different programs they'll allocate more money for than they need, and then they can kind of take a little bit out of many different programs to fund something like this. That way no one will know that it actually exists. Uh, overall, you know, the government has been the custodian of a lot of this, right? And they'll, they'll hand receipt it out to a uh, clear defense contractor to do some analysis, which I find highly unethical. You have uh, basically a sole source arrangement and you allow certain private corporate elements uh, to look at this develop a, a potential insight and then sell it back to the government for profit. And I think that's uh, totally unethical. Even if you're a skeptic of UFOs, just the fact that it appears there is some kind of secret program and something that's funded by taxpayer money that even the Congress doesn't know about, I think is a reason that like everyone should want to you know, ask these questions. In July of 2022, the inspector general found his complaint credible and urgent. The word credible is important, yes. you appreciate. Mm -hmm. So an official investigatory body of the United States government has determined that your allegations are credible. Correct. As soon as it aired, David Grush's life changed forever. And he's very careful now about not disclosing where he lives. And, and when I communicate with him now, it's through encrypted apps. And he's trying to be really careful about protecting himself and his family. Almost everybody found Grush credible even if some thought he had been fed false information. Skeptics that we've had on, they're not calling Grush a liar. They're more just skeptical of them actually being UFOs. Is this some kind of conspiracy where we're trying to be distracted and people are lying to Grush on purpose? So the skeptics haven't been like, this guy's making it all up. It's more of like, is there something else going on beyond what he's claiming? One place Grush's claims were taken seriously 
was Washington, D.C. In a city known for gridlock, within a month, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and Senator Mike Rounds announced an amendment to the fiscal year 2024 National Defense Authorization Act called the UAP Disclosure Act. While introducing the amendment on July 18th, 2023, Chuck Schumer announced, So my amendment will require the National Archive and Records Administration to create a collection of records from across government agencies that can be declassified for the public's use. These records will carry a presumption of immediate disclosure, which means they can only remain classified with good reason. And as many know, my mentor and dear friend who I miss so much, Harry Reid, was passionate about this issue. The big show was to come several days later on July 26th, when the House Oversight Committee called Grush, Ryan Graves, a former Navy pilot whose UAP experience was caught on camera, and Dave Fravor, a pilot involved in the Tic Tac incident, to testify before the National Security Subcommittee. Uh, Good morning and welcome to the most exciting subcommittee in Congress this week, the Subcommittee on National Security of the Border and Foreign Affairs for discussion of unidentified anomalous phenomenon. Thus, Representative Glenn Grothman of Wisconsin opened the hearing. For the first time in history, Congress would be hearing from witnesses with UAP encounters. The lack of transparency regarding UAPs has fueled wild speculation and debate for decades, eroding public trust in the very institutions that are meant to serve and protect them, as is evidenced by the large number of people we have here. I also want to point out in 1966, President Gerald Ford claimed to have seen a UFO, and in 1969 in Georgia, Jimmy Carter claimed to have seen a UFO. This has led Congress to establish entities to examine UAPs. The National Defense Authorization Act of 2022 established the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. However, AARO's budget remains classified, prohibiting meaningful oversight from Congress. In addition to AARO's efforts, NASA is leading an independent study on UAPs to identify how UAP data is gathered from both civilian and government. In his opening statement, Robert Garcia of California gave credit to the reporting of Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal for being a key reason this hearing was happening. Now, some of the earliest reporting on this issue was a groundbreaking 2017 New York Times report. Which, we, which revealed research, as we know now, on unidentified anomalous phenomena, or as many call UFOs, by the Defense Intelligence Agency. Mr. Graves and Commander Fravor's experiences with UAPs have also been documented by the public, not just by the New York Times, but CNN and many other national news outlets. Now, the sheer number of reports, whistleblowers, and stories of unidentified anomalous phenomena should raise real questions and warrant investigation and oversight. And that's why we are here today. Representative Jared Moskowitz of Florida acknowledged legitimate security concerns behind classifying some UAP information. What are UAPs? Are they foreign adversaries? Are they U.S. technology? Are they something else? They ask themselves, how come when a Russian jet shoots flares at one of our drones, we have perfect pictures and videos to show the American people and the world? But when it comes to UAPs, nothing. Of course, we must always protect our national security, to maintain our superiority, like when stealth helicopters were only rumored to exist, but were used in the Osama bin Laden raid in 2011. But we can't allow that to be used as a shield to keep the American people completely in the dark from basic truths. We should have disclosure today. We should have disclosure tomorrow. The time has come. For her opening statement, Representative Anna Luna of Florida drew on her own experience in the Air Force. One poll in particular found that 68% of Americans believe that the government is hiding information about UAPs and not being honest about what we know about them. And from my personal experience, I believe the same thing. In being an active duty service member working on an airfield, I've had conversations with many pilots where they were in fear of coming forward for retribution and or being taken off flight status. How do we know this? Because the government has said nothing to assure us otherwise. They have also did nothing to calm the concerns of over 20% of Americans who have reported to have seen UFOs. Just so that the press knows and the people know, we were even denied access to a classified briefing in a skiff prior to this hearing due to the amount of hoops that we had to jump through to grant temporary clearance to witness Grush, who has knowledge of classified information. 
It is time to have an open-minded discussion on this topic, to hear the evidence and understand the magnitude of what this means not just for our nation, but for humanity. It is no secret that partisan politics have taken over the United States. It is rare for Republicans or Democrats to agree on anything today. Despite polarizing politicians like AOC and Matt Gates sitting in the hearing, it remained bipartisan. Representative Tim Burchett of Tennessee acknowledged this in his opening statement. I want to thank everybody for making this happen today, and I want to remind everybody this is a nonpartisan issue. This has nothing to do with party politics. I think uh, the cover-up goes a lot deeper than that. But also, finally, I'd like to thank the, these three brave witnesses here. They took an oath. They took an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States, and dadgummit, they're doing it. And we owe them a debt of gratitude. It was time for the witnesses' opening statements. First, Ryan Graves spoke about the work he has done since his life-changing experience. I have experienced advanced UAP firsthand, and I'm here to voice the concerns of more than 30 commercial air crew and military veterans who have confided their similar encounters with me. Recognizing the need for action and answers, I founded Americans for Safe Aerospace. The organization has since become a haven for UAP witnesses who were previously unspoken due to the absence of a safe intake process. More than 30 witnesses have come forward and almost 5,000 Americans have joined us in the fight for transparency at safeaerospace.org. I recognize the skepticism surrounding this topic. If everyone could see the sensor and video data I witnessed, our national conversation would change. I urge us to put aside stigma and address the security and safety issue this topic represents. If UAP are foreign drones, it is an urgent national security problem. If it is something else, it is an issue for science. In either case, unidentified objects are concerned for flight safety. The American people deserve to know what is happening in our skies. It is long overdue. Dave Fravor not only recounted what transpired the day of the Tic Tac incident, but the actions that followed. What is shocking to us is that the incident was never investigated, none of my crew were ever questioned, tapes were never taken, and after a couple days it turned into a great story with friends. It wasn't until 2009 until Jay Stratton had contacted me to investigate. Unbeknownst to all, he was part of the ATIP program in the Pentagon, led by Lou Elizondo. I was contacted by Mr. Elizondo. We talked for a short period of time, and he said we'd be uh, in contact. A few weeks after that, I was made aware that Lou had left the Pentagon in protest and joined forces with Tom DeLonge, Chris Mellon, Steve Justice, and others to form Two Stars Academy, an organization that pressed the issue with leading industry experts and U.S. government officials. They worked with Leslie Keene, who is present today, Rob Blumenthal, and Helene Cooper to publish the articles in the New York Times, and it removed the stigma on the topic of UFOs, which is why we're here today. Those articles open the door for the government and public that cannot be closed. It has led to an interest from our elected officials who are not focused on little green men, but figuring out where these craft are, where are they from, the technology they possess, how do they operate? What concerns me is that there's no oversight from our elected officials on anything associated with our government processing or working on craft. Believe not from this world. If we in fact have programs that possess this technology and needs to have oversight from those people that the citizens of this great country elected in office to represent what is best for the United States and best for the citizens. David Grush used his opening statements to get on the record some of the incredible accusations he had leveled at the U.S. government. I am speaking to the facts as I've been told them. In the U.S. Air Force, in my National Reconnaissance Office, NRO, Reservist Capacity, I was a member of the UAP Task Force. I served at the NRO Operations Center on the Director's Briefing Staff, which included the coordination of the Presidential Daily Brief and supporting variety of contingency operations, which I was the Reserve Intelligence Division Chief uh, backup. In 2019, the UAP Task Force Director asked me to identify all special access programs and controlled access programs, also known as SAPs and CAPs. At the time, due to my extensive executive level intelligence support duties, I was cleared to literally all uh, relevant compartments and in a position of extreme trust, both in my military and civilian capacities. I was informed in the course of my official duties of a multi-decade uh, UAP crash retrieval and reverse engineering program, uh, to which I was denied access to those additional read-ons when I uh, requested it. I made the decision, based on the data I collected, to report this information to my superior and multiple inspectors general, and in effect becoming a whistleblower. As you know, I've suffered Retaliation for my decision, uh, but I am hopeful that my actions will ultimately lead uh, to a positive outcome of uh, increased transparency. Uh, thank you, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Yet as he was questioned by each member of Congress, Grush was unable to divulge much information. 
Can you give me the names and titles of the people with direct first-hand knowledge uh, and access to some of this crash retrieval, some of these crash retrieval programs, and maybe which facilities, military bases that would the recovered material would be in? I can't discuss that publicly, but I did provide that information both to the intel committees and the inspector general. And we could get that in the skiff if we were allowed to get in a skiff with you. Would that be probably what you would think? Sure, if you had the appropriate yeah. accesses, yeah. Uh, what special access programs cover this information, and how is it possible that they have evaded oversight for so long? Uh, I do know the names. Once again, I can't discuss that publicly and, and how they've evaded oversight. I, in a close setting, I can tell you the specific tradecraft use. All right. When, did, when do you think those programs began, and who authorized them? I do know a lot of that information, but that's something I can't discuss publicly. Very good. Mr. Grush, um, you've been able to answer in great detail on certain questions and then other things you say you're not able uh, to respond to. Can you just explain where you're drawing the line uh, and what's the basis uh, for that? Yeah, based on my DOPSER security review uh, and what they've determined that is unclassified. I see. So you're answering any questions that just call upon your knowledge of unclassified questions, but anything that relates to classified matters you're not commenting on in this context in an open session but happy to participate in a closed session at the right level yeah you received prior approval from the defense department to speak on certain issues correct correct through uh, dopser dod pre-publication and security review and i uh, just want to remind uh, the public uh, they're just looking from a security perspective uh, these are my own personal views and opinions uh, not the department's okay I'm, I'm asking that though mainly because i think that there are many people that would like to discredit you so it does bring a certain amount of credibility to your testimony. Uh, I'm required by law to do that as a former intelligence officer or I go to jail. Importantly, the representatives were able to question Graves and Fravor, getting information that had only been available in the media onto the congressional record. Delving into their encounters, Graves and Fravor were able to speak to the technology people were witnessing. Mr. Graves, how do you know that these were not our aircraft? We would see these objects being at 0.0, .0 Mach. So what that means, just like a river, if you throw a bobber in, it's going to float downstream. These objects were staying completely stationary in Category 4 hurricane winds. These same objects would then accelerate to supersonic speeds, 1.1, 1.2 Mach. Uh, and they would do so in very erratic and, and quick behaviors that we don't, I don't have an explanation for. So let's talk about G-forces of those vehicles. Could a human survive those G-forces with known technology today? No. No, not for the acceleration rates that we observed. Okay. What about what they looked like? How close did you get? Did you see a seam or a rivet or a section? And what I mean is, obviously, the jets you're flying have all those things. Did these objects have those? No, it was perfectly white, smooth, no windows. Although when we did take the original FLIR video that is out there, when you put it on a big screen, it actually had two little objects that came out of the bottom of it. Uh, we were primarily seeing dark gray or black cubes inside of a clear sphere. I'm sorry, dark gray or black cubes? Yes, yeah. inside of a clear sphere, where the apex or tips of the cube were touching the inside of that sphere. And that occurred over almost eight years. And as far as I know, it's still occurring. With technology so far surpassing anything known to the United States, it was obvious that this was a true threat to national security. You can go back through history of things showing up at certain areas and disabling our capabilities, which is disheartening. And for us, I mean, like I said, it, it completely disabled the radar and the aircraft when it tried to do it. And the only way we could see it is passively, which is how he got that image. So I think that's a, that's a concern on what are these doing, not only how do they operate, but their capabilities inside to do things like this. Based off of your own experience or the data that you've been privy to, is there any indication that these UAPs could be collecting reconnaissance information, Mr. Graves? Yes. Mr. Grush? Fair assessment. Mr. That's Fravor? Very possible. Again, in the national security vein, uh, is it possible that these UAPs would be probing our capabilities? Yes or no, Mr. Graves? Yes. Grush? Yes. Fravor? Definitely. Is it possible that these UAPs are testing for vulnerabilities in our current systems? Yes. Yes. Possible. Do you feel, based off of your experience and the information that you've been privy to, that these UAP, UAPs uh, provide uh, an existential threat to the national security of the United States? Mr. Graves? Potentially. As they drilled into the state of UAP reporting, 
It was abundantly clear that the government is woefully unprepared to handle the current situation. Um, what percentage of UAP sightings in your belief go unreported by our pilots? This is an approximation based off of my personal experience speaking with a number of pilots, but uh, I would estimate we're somewhere near 5% reporting perhaps. I'll break that down two ways. First, when we were first experiencing these objects off the eastern seaboard in the 2014 to 2015 time period, anyone that had upgraded their radar systems were seeing these objects. So there was a large number of my colleagues uh, that were detecting these objects off the eastern seaboard. They were fur further correlating that information with the other onboard sensors, uh, and many of them also had their own uh, eye sightings as well of these objects. Now, that was our personal first, uh, first-hand experience at the time. Since then, uh, as I've engaged this topic, uh, others have reached out to me to share their experiences, both uh, on the military side as well as the commercial aviation side. On the military aviation side, uh, veterans that have recently got out have shared their stories and have expressed how the objects we were seeing in 2014, 2015 uh, continued all the way to 2019, 2020, and beyond. And so it became a generational issue for naval aviators on the eastern seaboard. This was something we were briefing uh, to new students. This is something that was included in the notice to airmen to ensure that there was no uh, uh, accidents. Um, and now with commercial aviators, they are reaching out because they're having somewhat similar experiences as our military brothers and sisters, but they do not have any reporting system that they can send this to. It was clear that Congress needed to take action. Not having the system for, for reporting, um, would you both agree that it's harmful to not just our national security interests, but to understand this phenomenon of what's happening with UAPs? I think it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's actually it's a travesty that we don't have a system to correlate this and actually investigate. You know, so if you took the East Coast, you know, there's, there's, there's coastal radars out there that monitor our air defense identification zone, so out to 200 miles. Uh, they can track these, you know, so when you see them, they could actually go and pull that data and, and get maneuvering. And, and instead of just having the airplanes, there's other data sources out there. And I've talked to other government officials on this. So you need a centrally located repository that these reports go to. So if you just stuck it in DOD, you wouldn't get anything out of the Intelligence Committee because they have a tendency to not to talk. But if you had a central location where these reports would come in, not just military, but also commercial aviation, because there's a lot of that going on, especially if you talk to anyone that flies from here to Hawaii, over the Pacific, they see odd lights. So I think you need to develop something that allows you a central point to collect the data in order to investigate. There needs to be a location where this information is centralized for processing, and there needs to be a two-way communication loop so the operators on the front end have a feedback and can can get best practices on how to process the information, what to do, uh, and to ensure that they, they, their reporting is being listened to. And I think one of the clear outcomes of this hearing already um, is that there has to be a safe and transparent reporting process for pilots, both on the commercial side and the military side, to be able to report UAPs in a way that's also transparent, but also understands the scope of our, of our national security interests uh, and what uh, may be classified or not. But I think there has to be some sort of system. And so that's something that I hope can be an outcome that this committee can, um, can work on. Um, is there anything else for just for the two of you briefly beyond this reporting system that you think that we can do as a government to encourage and facilitate more civilian reporting? On I think the we're civilian? doing it right now. Okay, great. I think this hearing is, is going to show the American people that their government takes this topic seriously. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to want to look into what we can do to make more of this information public. Uh, I think there's certainly a time period after which it should always be made public and people have been concerned about these issues, like I said since I was in high school. If there's no further business without objection, the subcommittee stands adjourned. I was just more surprised, like seeing it in the U.S. Capitol unfolding is a lot different than seeing the interview that we did. It was just like, wow, this is really happening. I don't think it's still fully set in for me, the magnitude of it, and just what a big deal it is that these hearings happened in Congress. On December 14th, 2023, the UAP Disclosure Act was passed by the Senate and House as part of the Defense Authorization Act, but it had been neutered. Two major provisions were stripped out. After pressure from a powerful group of Republicans in the House, the provision to create a presidential advisory panel tasked with sorting through which records would be disclosed was killed. Schumer said, this model's been a terrific success for decades. It should be used again with UAPs. Representative Tim Burchett proposed that the FAA be required to forward reports from commercial airline pilots, but was told by Schumer and others 
that this wouldn't even be considered because of pushback from the intelligence community. Added to the bill was a list of exemptions for UAP disclosure. Included were if the documents could threaten national defense, compromise national intelligence, or threaten sources and methods of intel gathering. Burchett reacted, it's about greed. It's about power. It's about control. All of those things that run Washington, D.C. And it's obvious that some of my colleagues have been compromised. They're studying something over there with our money. Despite his disappointment in the watered-down version, Schumer said the legislation was a major win for government transparency on UAPs. David Grush said it was a mixed bag of success, believing that while it was good that a provision was included to fence off money for illegal special access programs, the final bill did not go far enough. At the same time the government was taking its first steps towards disclosure, members of the press were looking further into David Grush. On August 9, 2023, The Intercept uncovered a series of mental health episodes Grush had undergone. Even though those instances were known to the agencies he worked for, Grush retained his security clearances. As many soldiers who've served in Afghanistan and other war zones have encountered, he had some problems as a result. He got treatment for that. It didn't affect his service in the government. He was still highly placed. But now people are using that to cast doubt on what he had to say. We don't think it has any real relevance to his information, which, as I said, we carefully vetted. Ross Colthart published Grush's response to the article on X. It reads, It has come to my attention that The Intercept intends to publish an article about two incidents in 2014 and 2018 that highlights previous personal struggles I had with post-traumatic stress disorder, grief, and depression. As I stated under oath in my congressional testimony, over 40 credentialed intelligence and military personnel provided myself and my colleagues the information I transmitted to the intelligence community inspector general, and I took the leadership role to represent the concerns of those distinguished and patriotic individuals. In spite of the personal attacks on Grush bleeding into the public eye, others are stepping forward. So there are other people out there who have this information, we understand. Some of them have already talked to Congress. We don't know what they said because it's classified. And Grush gave, uh, you know, 1,100 pages of classified testimony to Congress. We don't know what he told Congress in that testimony because it's classified. But there are others who either have or will be or may be coming forward now to provide that information. And the question is, at what point might they come out and talk publicly? And that's the next step. On September 1st, 2023, the Department of Defense made good on their promise. They launched a one-stop shop website for all declassified information on UAPs. The first planned addition to the website is a form where U.S. government employees contractors, and service members can submit information on hidden UAP programs. Following that, a reporting process for the general public will be rolled out. Their goal is that the site will allow DOD service members or civilians to provide reports via a private and secure means. Anybody can currently visit the site at aaro.mil. Across the front page is a statement from Aero Director, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, which reads, Welcome to the website for the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. We look forward to using the site to regularly update the public about Arrow's work and findings, and to provide a mechanism for UAP reporting. I think this is just the beginning. Obviously, we'll have to keep the heat on, and not just News Nation. If we want to see this push forward, all media has to hold them to the fire a little bit in terms of the lawmakers. There really isn't a story bigger than this for most people, if, if they really think about it. I mean, the thought of another life form out there, other life forms in the universe, that sort of trumps anything else. I think that's one reason to stay on it. Also, I I just think the government accountability aspect of it is really important. Again, just the money and the fact that our constitution isn't set up for the government to have like a secret program that none of the people we elect have anything to do with. I mean, it's just kind of like a creepy movie, you know? (laughs) There's just so many unanswered questions. I mean, how could we not stay on it? I mean, there's, I feel like it's just like a little tease that we got. I don't think that media can be put back in the bottle. It's got to move forward, maybe in fits and starts, but people are demanding to know. So whether disclosure is something that's going to happen in six months or six years, I mean, who knows, but I think we're on the right track. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review on your favorite podcasting app. 
it helps get this content in front of more listeners, which means we can produce more episodes more often. Visit our website at www.strange-phenomenon.com for a full list of sources and more episodes. A special thanks to Brian Enton and Ralph Blumenthal for sharing your knowledge and experiences with us. We'd also like to thank News Nation for allowing us to sample clips from their great reporting on the UFO whistleblower story. Additional audio from C-SPAN. Strange Phenomenon is hosted by Ray Tarara. It's written and produced by R.J. Blake and Ray Tarara. Theme music by Tara Monk.